In this video, we will discuss evolution and speciation. Evolution is the change in heritable characteristics of a population. Speciation is the process that generates new species through natural selection. The key concepts we'll cover in this video include the theories of Lamarck and Darwin, the process of creating new species through speciation, and evidence for evolution, including homologous and analogous structures, comparative genomics, phylogenic trees, as well as selective breeding. These key concepts are some of the most important topics covered in the IB biology course. Evolution is the force responsible for the creation of a new species on Earth, or what is termed speciation. It is hypothesized that all life, all species current and past, evolved from a single ancestral cell over three to four billion years ago. As life on this planet developed, the genetic code of the population of the ancestral cells accumulated small genetic changes that were built upon and passed on until new species were formed. In order for genetic changes or mutations to be passed down into the next generation, the mutation must occur in the germ cells or sex cells that transfer the genetic information to the next generation. Any genetic change that occurs in a somatic or body cell will be lost when the organism dies. Darwin made this distinction from his predecessor Lamarck, who thought that physical changes in organisms during their lifetime could be passed to their offspring. This could be from increased use or developed over time. For instance, if a giraffe continually reaches for the taller leaves on a tree, the neck will stretch and that giraffe will produce offspring with longer necks. Darwin suggested that variation has to already exist in the population and would be passed down from parent to offspring. Longer necked giraffes survive more often to reproduce and have offspring with longer necks. Discovery after discovery, from genetics to DNA to physiology, would later support Darwin's theory of evolution. Before we take a look at some of the evidence for evolution, let's first learn about some of the mechanisms in which new species arise, or speciation. Speciation is the formation of new species by the splitting of an existing species to create two or more new species. First, let's make sure we're familiar with the biological definition of the term species, which is a group of organisms who can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. In order for offspring to be fertile, the organisms must be very similar in their genetic makeup. So members of the same species have very similar features and morphologies with minor variations due to their genetic similarities. Different species cannot breed with each other because there is enough genetic difference between the species that they cannot combine to produce viable offspring. If the species are close enough, they are sometimes able to produce offspring, but they will be infertile like the liger, a cross between a tiger and lion. So how does speciation occur? There needs to be two factors at play for speciation to happen. One factor is differential selection, and the other is reproductive isolation. Reproductive isolation occurs when populations stop breeding with each other. There could be all kinds of reasons for this, including behavioral, such as the development of different mating calls, or temporal, being active at different times of the day. However, often the isolating event is geographical, where there's a physical barrier that separates members of the population, like a river or mountain formation. Once the population is separated, there also needs to be differential selection. This means each population must be experiencing different selection pressures, like different predators or food sources that select for different adaptations. Let's take the chimpanzee and bonobo as an example. The physical barrier here is the Congo River that the ancestral population of both species crossed when it was very low. When the river rose again, the population was reproductively isolated. 
North of the Congo River, the last common ancestor population of both species experienced low food sources, whereas south of the Congo River, the population had more plentiful food resources. It is hypothesized that this differential selection pressure of food sources pushed chimps and bonobos apart in their physical features as well as behavioral patterns. Chimps are larger and more aggressive with a patriarchal social structure, while bonobos are smaller, more peaceful with a matriarchal social structure. Now that we've seen how speciation can occur, let's look at some of the evidence for evolution and speciation. We are only considering some of the evidence of evolution. In reality, virtually every topic in biology can be better understood when looking at it through the lens of evolution. Homologous structures are similar physical structures in organisms that share a common ancestor, but the structures serve different functions. These structures are seen throughout living and fossilized species and support the theory that related species speciated from a common ancestor. An example is the pentadactyl limb, which is the limb of vertebrate species that has five toes or fingers. It's hypothesized that all tetrapod vertebrates, or animals with forelegs and backbones, have derived or adapted these limbs for specific uses and environments from one common ancestor. In our diagram, we can see a generalized limb plan of the common ancestor that has a basic layout that includes the humerus, radius, ulna, and so forth in the arm, with the same plan that includes a femur, tibia, and fibula in the leg. This basic plan has been adapted for different functions in the bat, whose wing is evolved for flight, the whale, where it functions as a flipper for swimming, and monkey, where it's adapted for grasping. Note that all have a similar underlying bone layout of the common ancestor, but bones have elongated or shortened depending on the way the limb has evolved for different uses in different species. This evidence supports that these species shared a common ancestor with a similar limb who then adapted to different environments through divergent evolution. Analogous structures are structures in different species that have a similar function and may look similar, but they have evolved independently of each other. This is an example of convergent evolution, where different unrelated species may evolve similarities if in a similar environment or selection pressure. An example of an analogous structure is a bat and insect wing. They have a similar function, but have no similarities in their underlying structures because they evolved separately. If we compare analogous and homologous structures, we can see that the analogous structures will be formed from convergent evolution, while homologous structures form from divergent evolution. Homologous structures involve the modification of a similar body part, while analogous structures involve different body plans. Analogous structures are used for similar things, like flying, while homologous structures are used for different functions. Homologous structures implies a recent common ancestor, while analogous structures implies a distant common ancestor. In the past, analogous structures have led to mistakes in classifying organisms. Since these structures are ultimately controlled and coded for at the genetic level, clearer and more direct data can be found studying the genetic differences between species. When populations are reproductively isolated, they no longer share their genetic information and are genetically isolated from each other. Mutations will pop up in each population and they're not shared between the isolated populations. Over time, the buildup of mutations causes enough genetic differences to create new species through speciation. Comparative genomics is the study of comparing the similarities and differences between genetic sequences of different species. The DNA, RNA, or amino acid sequence of a protein shared between species can be used in this type of research. When two species share highly similar genetic or amino acid sequences, this indicates that they are closely related 
and that their last common ancestor speciated relatively recently in the past. When genetic or amino acid sequences have more differences, this indicates that they are less related and their last common ancestor speciated further back in time. When looking at many different species, the degree of relatedness can be organized into a cladogram or phylogenetic tree. Branching points or nodes indicate speciation. The root indicates the last common ancestor of all the species represented, while the length of each branch indicates how long ago speciation occurred to create the divergent species. A long branch indicates a common ancestor further back in time and less genetic relatedness, while a shorter branch indicates a common ancestor relatively recently and with more genetic similarities. A common misunderstanding in evolution is wondering how all the diverse variety of species could have possibly emerged from one common ancestor. Our next piece of evidence, selective breeding, sheds some light on this concern. Selective breeding is a method humans have been practicing for thousands of years. When a horse breeder breeds the fastest stallion with the fastest mare, hoping for an even faster horse, we call the practice selective breeding. When humans direct the breeding process, they put an especially strong selection pressure on the population of horses, food crop, or other domesticated species. This is called artificial selection. Under this strong selection, Alleles that were never combined together before begin producing new physical traits. This happens with natural selection as well, but usually over a much longer time frame as the selection pressure is typically not as strong as with artificial selection. Under artificial selection, the mustard plant has produced cauliflower, kale, broccoli, and cabbage. If left to natural selection, the mustard plant would likely not have produced the different variety of food crops we see today. However, the fact that within its genetics, it had the possibility of developing these new cultivars indicates that there is much genetic potential in every species to generate new traits through recombination of alleles. One can also look to the wolf, the last common ancestor of all domesticated dog breeds, to see how much genetic potential was in that gene pool. When humans started recombining alleles in new ways through artificial selection, such as breeding for shepherding behaviors, then breeds like the Old English Sheepdog emerged. Dog breeds like Beagles emerged when breeding for hunting behaviors, while the Shih Tzu was bred in royal palaces in China to alert for visitors and guests. In this video, we looked at Lamarck and Darwin's theory of evolution and saw that the key difference between them is that Darwin's theory suggested that variation already exists in the population, and those that were fit to survive passed down those traits to the next generation, while Lamarck believed these traits developed over a lifetime. We saw that speciation occurs when a population splits into two or more species, and it requires both reproductive isolation that usually occurs through geographic isolation, and also differential selection, or different selection pressures in the environment for each population. We also looked at evidence for evolution, including homologous structures, which have similar underlying structures inherited from a common ancestor. And these have adapted to different environments through divergent evolution. Another piece of evidence is comparing genetic and amino acid sequences of different species to determine their relatedness as well as how long ago they speciated from a common ancestor. Finally, we saw that selective breeding provides evidence for the genetic potential in species when a strong selection pressure, like artificial selection, is applied to the population.